So thank you very much for the introduction and the thanks everyone for attending this uh, final talk in the, in the parallel session. Um, so we want to take you on a journey through our project at ProRail, which is about asset management with computer vision. And there are three things that we want to touch upon. First of all, our use case. What's the use for computer vision at ProRail and what can make such a project su successful? Secondly, the models that we're using. So we want to give you some insights into the choices that we made for the particular models. And finally, how to efficiently work with a large corpus of images. Um, so th th those last two parts will be a bit more technical. Um, so my name is Richard Bartels, and that's Jasper. We're both data scientists at Vantage AI, and we're doing computer vision at ProRail. So first a bit about ProRail. What is ProRail? ProRail is the largest, is the owner of the, of the railway in the Netherlands. Um, so they own the track, but they also own the crossings, bridges, stations, etc. And not only do they own um, all of this stuff, but they also are responsible for maintaining it and making sure that there won't be any delays due to failure of any of these systems. So they'll have to do asset management. Um, and doing efficient asset management means having detailed knowledge uh, of the whereabouts of your assets and of the state of your assets. Um, and how they did this in the past was in the following way. They sent somebody out onto the track to inspect it by hand. Well, there are a bunch of downsides with this. First one, if you send a person out onto the rail track, you have to stop all the trains from running, otherwise it's kind of dangerous. Um, secondly, this person will inspect um, by hand and then enter it manually into a database, which is also prone to error. So there are a bunch of ways in which you could do this more efficiently. Um, and that's why the following thing exists. A video inspection train. And this is a train that's being operated um, twice a year to cover the entire Netherlands um, and take pictures of the track. Um, and this prevents two things, right? You don't have to send people out onto the track anymore, um, so then you have to less downtime. And secondly, um, you could, in principle, also analyze these images automatically and thereby not only do it faster, but also um, more accurately than a, a human being could. Um, so just to give you an insight in the types of pictures that we're dealing with, they look in the following way. Um, the pointer doesn't work on the screen, so I'll just tell you. Um, you have detailed um, pictures of the track, um, then there are panoramic pictures um, of the front and the back, side pictures of the track, and zoom in uh, pictures of the railway track. And we're working with these zoom ins that you see in the middle, and I'll tell you why in a second. So, what kind of stuff could you do with um, these images of rail railway track? First of all, um, we have a lot of them, about 50 million um, for each campaign of the Netherlands. Um, and you can find all kinds of stuff in these images. For instance, you could localize your assets. Like here we see a crossing and we know its location if we also know the location um, of the image. Secondly, you might want to do more advanced things. So maybe you run through the railway track and you find this current box and you actually see that it's broken. So you could tag um, assets as being broken. And finally, um, you might want to monitor the state of your assets over time. So maybe you see here this insulation joint and we see that it has degraded by 25%. So we, we might want to replace it sometime soon. Um, and in fact, the insulation joint is the asset that we're working on. First, only its uh, localization, but also later its state. Um, and we're doing this be for two reasons. It's easy to detect on the track because it's just this horizontal stripe on the track. So from a machine learning point of view, it's easy. Um, and secondly, it has very high business value. Because if these things fail, they can cause signaling failures, which are the main cause, uh, or one of the main causes for delays. Um, so there's very high business value in knowing where these things are. And at the po uh, moment, ProRail doesn't know that very accurately. So it's great working with all of these images, and you can, there are bunch of use cases, but the most important thing is also to bring that, um, um, include the whole end-to-end -end process. So what we had to do at first was actually label the images because they were not labeled. We had to make sure that the location data matched to the image was correct. Then the fun part starts in training a model. Um, but then you also have to convince a business that your predictions actually match other sources 
And finally, make sure that the information lands at the place where it's supposed to land in the database where end users will be using it. And we're responsible for the, this entire process, and by now we've covered 40% of the Netherlands and finishing up with the last 60% updating this information. Um, so just a brief recap, we have a train covering the Netherlands, taking pictures and finding different assets, and we can do that at ProRail um, and thereby create some business value. Um, so that's that for the use case. Now let's switch gears and move on to computer vision. So how do you analyze or how do we analyze these images at ProRail? So these are the images that we're dealing with. We have on the right images of track without an, uh, an insulation joint on it, um, and on the left an image um, with an insulation joint. And we want to classify does it have an insulation joint or not. So the technique we're using for this is um, convolutional neural networks, which are used for um, image recognition. Um, who has worked with these networks before? I see a few hands. Um, anyway, I'll go through them a little bit just to make sure we're all on the same page. So a convolutional neural network um, is a neural network that consists out of a bunch of convolutional layers and a bunch of dense layers at the end, which try to classify um, what, image, uh, what class this image belongs to. So convolution works in the following way. Let's say we have an image in blue, and we have a filter in gray moving over the image. This filter is applied at each uh, part of the image, and out will come a filtered image um, in green. And the, the, the benefit of this is that you can use the same filter all over the image to detect similar features, for example, horizontal lines or vertical lines. And that way, these convolutional layers are much more efficient than these dense layers at the end. Um, and by applying multiple, and we can apply this multiple times. So filter, again, the filtered images. So here's an example, just very briefly. Let's say we have an image that's dark here, light there. We can apply a filter for vertical lines, and we can indeed see that there will be a vertical line at the center. But the idea of a convolutional neural network is that it will learn these things, but these, the best type of filter by itself. So that's what we're using for this image analysis. Um, so just to give you a quick um, preview, um, here's an, a, a picture of a joint. We apply a first layer of filters. So in fact, we have 10 different filters, outcome 10 filtered images. We apply another layer of 20 filters to these filtered images again. Um, and then the final layer um, with 30 filters. And then we compress all of this information, and then we come to the conclusion, yes, indeed, there's a joint in it. You can actually see it pop up also in the final layer. Um, so now Jasper will take you a bit through the technical implementation. Exactly. So this was only theory. Um, I will show you how we implemented this at ProRail. Uh, it will be a quick, brief uh, introduction to Keras, and for some people it might be uh, just uh, a second time you can see everything at once. Uh, so let's have a look. Uh, this was the sketch of the, the model we had. And if we import TensorFlow, we can basically add an extra line of code for every layer we have in our model. And as you can see, we have uh, three convolutional layers uh, at, the, at the top, um, after which we pull, then we flatten things out, and at the end, there's a, a dense section. Okay. Let me now, for uh, I'll just write this a little bit uh, more shortly on one line. Um, to finish the model, we need two extra things. We need a loss function and uh, the algorithm which optimizes or yeah, well, optimizes the loss function. Um, okay, and that's that's all that's to it. So now we can fit our model to our train images and evaluate on our test images. And this is the output we get. So as you can see, it loops through 60,000 images, um, and then it performs an evaluation on 10,000 test images. And as you can see, we've got a loss of z uh, 0 0.2. Well, that doesn't say a lot. So um, TensorFlow allows us to uh, add some metrics. Um, and metrics are not necessary for training the model, but it will give us a better description of the performance um, after it's trained. So the big difference between metrics and the loss function is that for the loss function it has to be 
a differentiable function, but a metric can actually be any function you want. So we choose accuracy, and as you can see, our accuracy, uh, accuracy at the moment is 92%. So 92% of the images are classified with the right label. Um, okay, but now we're looking at all the images just once during the training process, and um, it's actually possible to loop over all the images multiple times. Uh, that's done with uh, epochs. Uh, so let's just run a hundred epochs and then the model will be much better because it's seen a lot more data. Um, or well, at least it has had more time to converge to uh, an optimal point. But now the problem is this will take long and well, we might be overfitting, right? Because we have no, we, we don't see uh, how the model is performing during the training process. Well, um, so maybe the, uh, the loss function on the train uh, set is still going down, but on our validation set we might be going up. We don't know. Uh, for this reason, there are callbacks. They are also implemented in uh, TensorFlow, so you can just import a callback. Uh, right now, we're implementing early stopping. And basically what it does is it it gives you, callbacks gives you insight in the performance of the model during the training process. And right now what this does is it monitors the loss on the validation set and when it's not improving for five epochs after each other, that's the patient's uh, parameter, then it will already stop. So maybe after five, 50 epochs. Um, for this, you need a validation set, and we, at the moment we don't have that yet. So, but we can simply add it um, like this, and, and that's all that's through it. So, uh, just a quick recap: if you want to make a TensorFlow model, you need an optimizer for the loss function, and if you want, you can add some metrics. Um, and to fit the model, you can choose the amount of epochs you need. Um, make a validation set so the callbacks can actually monitor the training process. Um, I think that's it. So back to you, Richard. Yeah, so Jasper has just shown us the, the model that we're actually using um, for this particular case of detecting insulation joints with three convolutional layers, but maybe we want to do something more complex or, or something else. So who of you, as um, I asked you already, who has worked with uh, convolutional neural networks, who of you knows about transfer learning? So I can see quite a few hands. Um, can I get the pointer? So I'll tell you also how we, um, what we do with transfer learning at, at ProRail. But first, let me just tell you what transfer learning is. So let's again step, take a step back and look at this convolutional neural network. Um, we have a network here that can maybe um, predict a bunch of different classes. Let's say it has, it's a network um, that has been trained on lots of images and it can predict all of these classes. For instance, on the ImageNet data, data set, which has a thousand types of images and 50 million images or so. Um, we can actually use the fact that these networks are very good um, using a technique called transfer learning. And what you do there is you would use this initial part of the network as sort of a feature extractor. So this has been pre-trained to extract features from images to be able to make classifications, but maybe we, we can, these features can also transfer to our use case. Um, so you would use this first part of the network and then discard the latter part, which actually is very specific to the task at hand, namely classifying ImageNet images, um, and replace that with another um, network which is specific to our cause. Um, so that would be classifying if there's an insulation joint in there. So what you can do then um, is leave the initial um, part of the network as is um, and only train this very last part of the network. Um, and by doing this, you don't need a huge amount of data to train a very complex network that has been ve very well thought through by experts, but you can still use the power of this network um, because you need much less training data to just um, make it work on your use case. Um, so that's what we're actually doing also at ProRail, but it doesn't always work well. Um, and let me also tell you why. Um, but first, before I go there, um, I forgot to show, I also want to show you how you can quickly actually implement this in TensorFlow. 
Um, so we saw the model before, um, and now we just have to make one tiny um, change to it. So what we do here is, instead of our own network, we start with a base model, which is the pre-trained transfer learning model. Um, we say we import it um, directly from TensorFlow, and we specify that the weights have to come from ImageNet. So this is a pre-trained model that has been trained on ImageNet. And we say include top is false, so we discard the final layers. Um, and the only thing that we're constrained with is the input shape of the images, because we have to um, turn our uh, images into the same input shape in order to make it work with this network. So then we can construct a model, which start with this base model, and then on top of that we can add our own um, dense layers, um, and we can only train those um, for our uh, purpose. So we can say model layers, the first layer, the base model, trainable is false, so it won't train um, the base layers, only the latter layers. But why might it fail? Well, ImageNet data, for instance, captures all kinds of classes, car, trucks, cats, dogs. But those don't necessarily translate well to our use case, um, which is these black and white images of just pure railway track. Um, and we actually found that um, initially um, it might not that it didn't work very well when we still had a very small data set. And there are two reasons for this. First of all, <coughs> so these features might not transfer well. So what you could do um, in that case are two things. Um, you could open up the initial layers also for training at a later stage. So you can fine tune them so they better match your data set. But then if your data set is small, you start overfitting um, very fast. And the second thing is, you could cut back even more layers. So maybe only use the first two, three, four, five layers of the, um, of the pre-trained network, because those will um, extract more basic features um, and not maybe features that are specific to cat's ears or something. Um, but we find that with a larger data set and for more complex causes, there is actually a use for us in transfer learning. So initially also our use case was we had uh, to detect 95% of the joints um, and our simple model was already um, sufficient for that. So we just needed a small pocket knife. But now we want to find more, um, exclude more false positives, such as leaves on a track, which actually got classified false positive. So leaves are also bad on train track and computer vision. Um, and maybe we can do that with better with a more extensive network or when we move on to other types of data, so um, classifying degradation, etc. So that's it for the model side. And now Jasper will tell you um, how to deal with large sums of images when training a neural network. Exactly. So um, what we did before um, was we fitted the model uh, and just gave the whole training set to the model at once. But the, the problem with that is that right now we have so many images that we can, can't just load them in memory in, on, our, on our machine. Uh, so the, the load is just too heavy. And well, an easy fix for that is that we're gonna make small chunks of all the data and we give all these small parts to the, uh, the model separately. Um, which is possible with TensorFlow, of course. How you do that? How do you do that? Um, we create an object um, for, uh, da uh, which is a data set, and you can uh, make a data set with a uh, simple CSV, with a generator or iterator, but right now we choose to list all the files in a certain directory. Uh, what this gives is a list of all these files, um, and if you look carefully, they are sometimes in the directory with a zero and sometimes in the directory with a one. So this whole uh, list contains the uh, positives and the negatives. Um, but it, the, data st the list is not created directly itself. This is just a reference to all the, to all the image data. Um, but we're not interested in the file paths. We're actually interested in the images itself. So what we're doing now is we're going to map a function over this data set, which is called preprocess. Um, I wrote it down right here. Basically what it's just, it's just load, it loads the image and it also extracts the label and combines them together. Uh, so what we have right now is um, a list of all the images, a very long list. And it's not calculated already, but this is just a reference to uh, all the images. Okay. Um, 
a trick that's often used in computer vision uh, for creating even more training data uh, is that you augment the data. So when we have a picture, a, a picture of a, a joint, we can flip it, rotate it, adjust the brightness, which will give us a lot of other pictures of the isolation joint. Um, and in TensorFlow, there are uh, the, uh, all these transformations are already implemented. So with a few lines of code, I can write a function which uh, I can also map over our data set, such that in a way that when there's a picture with a certain probability, sometimes it's flipped, sometimes it rotates, and sometimes the brightness is adjusted. Okay, um, now there are a few other steps that we're going to do. First of all, it's also uh, possible to shuffle our data set. And it's a little bit different than you would expect. Instead of shuffling all the images in the whole list, uh, this method creates a buffer of 200 images, and then of, of the first 200 images, and then it will select of one of those 200 as the first image that it outputs. Then, and not the image 201 is added to our buffer, um, and then from those 200 pictures, the second pi uh, picture of our list is created. So it basically has a buffer in memory, and it samples out of this buffer. And the way you do that is by just calling shuffle and you set the buffer size. For uh, the more advanced uh, TensorFlow users, you can already think about what, what would be a more efficient time of shuffling the data, uh, and we'll, I will come back to that later. Um, so the second step is we're going to create batches. Um, such in a way that we can deliver 32 images to the model at once, so that we're not going to backpropagate after every image. Um, and these are basically the little chunks we're feeding to our model. So we're not giving the whole list at once, but we'll just present the first 32 images and then the second 32 images, etc. cetera. Um, and then there's the last trick we use is we repeat this minus one times, which means we uh, repeat, or this, this generates an infinite amount of images. Because when we're training, we don't know how long we want to train. And now we can just uh, fit our model on this data by replacing the X and Y just with the data set. Um, and well, then we're done. But now, we've got another problem, and that's the last thing we're gonna talk about in this talk, and that's the problem of uh, combining the CPU with the GPU. The model right now is trained, uh, the, the, these batches are created by the CPU, which is much slower than the GPU, which is used for the training process. Um, so basically our CPU cannot, cannot keep up with our GPU. Um, so let's get back to the code, and I'll show you what the situation is right now. The first batch is prepared by the CPU, and after that's done, the GPU starts training, and the CPU is doing nothing. Uh, so let's first fix that problem. What we want, actually, is that they run in parallel, so that CPU already starts preparing the second batch, while the GPU is training on the first batch. And it can, you can just do that with a simple line of code, and again, uh, adding a buffer, uh, so that maybe the CPU has some, uh, yeah, has some, can have some slack, and this GPU never runs out of new um, batches. But if we have a closer look, when the CPU is preparing such a batch, it has to do 32 images after each other, um, but most computers have more CPUs, so we're going to use all of them and run that in parallel. So the map functions you see on the top, we can actually run them next to each other. And the machine we, we're using has one GPU and 12 CPUs. So we add a parameter that says use 12, uh, yeah, well, work on 12 images in parallel. The last optimization is that 
um, it in some at some point uh, or in some situations it can take some time to load an image from um, well the server you're working on. We train our model remotely, um, and actually retrieving the images can take some time. Um, well, and you guessed it. Also, this can be done in parallel with just one line of code, um, which is called interleave. And uh, again, uh, we set the number of parallel calls to 12. If you have no idea what to do with this number, then you can just find out by trial and error and look what it does. But you can also go to autopilot and just replace it all with this TensorFlow line. And then TensorFlow will look during the training time what's the best parameter for you. Um, OK, well, let's just uh, get back one more time. Because I gave you an exercise, I was wondering if somebody already solved it. Otherwise, I will give you the answer. Um, as you've seen, this gives you a lot of freedom uh, creating a data set for your neural network. But there are sometimes some small issues. And the one I want to address is that when you're creating a buffer, um, this buffer is uh, sometimes quite large if the objects in your buffer are quite large. So the, the thing right now is that we process the image before we were going to shuffle it. Uh, which is good because we can maybe crop and resize the image before we shuffle it. So the images in our buffer are smaller than the original images. But if we shuffled all the way on the top, then we only shuffled the file paths, which are even, even smaller than the picture. So that would be a more efficient way. So, um, well, lots of things to optimize. We, uh, well, first it was possible to uh, increase uh, our speed with, uh, well, we trained 10 times faster than we did before, which was great. Um, so what did we talk about? We showed you how we use computer vision at ProRail, which model you want to use, and at the end, we showed you how you can efficiently input the data into your training process. So now you've got all the ingredients um, to solve our Kaggle case. We set all. We gave all the data to Gaggle, and uh, if you visit this link, you can give it a, you a try yourself. There's also a notebook included, and we'll set the slides on LinkedIn, so uh, you can have a look at that and uh, try it yourself. Thanks for your attention.